Welcome, everybody. What's going on? It's your man, John Hudson, with Focus Driven. You're Focus Driven now with John Hudson. And today's guest is, oh my goodness, like nobody in the world knows how much this woman means to me. Uh, before I introduce her, I just want to tell her thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and let me give people kind of a small background of who this young lady is but she's a heavy educator throughout the Kansas City area and abroad. Of course, she is known to me as one of the best, and I'm not kidding with you folks, she's known to me as one of the best contemporary urban jazz singers in the world. She has sung all across the country, even sung for a few of our presidents back in the day, and I am just excited to have her on my show today. Also, too, she's an activist, and she's been an activist for over 20-something years. This is nothing new to the game. She's, she's well aware of the times today that we live in, and she's well aware of what is going on and how it's affecting uh, the African-American community and abroad. And on a personal level, she mentored me back when I was in my late 19s, early 20s, after I came back from playing ball. She literally took me under her wing, and I was with a gospel group at the time, and once I decided to leave the group, she said, John, I see something in you that's a little bit more special, and she told me to start using my gifts, and she sparked with me to write uh, one of my first books, and here I am now, author of 15 bestsellers. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I got Miss Lisa Henry! Hey! Hey, hey, hey! How's everybody out there? Oh, Hope you're doing all right. Hope your mental health is together. There you oh, go. Lisa. <laughs> oh my goodness, girl. Let me tell you something. You <laughs> hit the you hit the ball rolling like it has never been rolled before. <coughs> Excuse mental me. Mental yeah. health during this time is very, very important. Uh, before I talk to you today, I had a meeting scheduled, and he canceled, but I know he's going to get back with me. I had a meeting scheduled with Gerard Raven, who mm. is the CEO of Swope Health Services here mm. in the Kansas City area. And I can't wait to talk to him, but before I do, it was kind of like God was saying, okay, I got to put him back because you got to talk to Lisa first about <laughs> where, if I was to ask you today, how can we help each other during this time of racism, social justice, inequality, and overall awareness from so many facets of life? Where would you start or give me kind of a synopsis of what people need to be aware of to start during these times? Oh gosh, that that's a, that's great, a big question. And I know we do. <laughs> we can be out here for a while, but we only got 30 minutes. <laughs> right, right. Okay, well, I'll try to be quick. Well, yeah. I think a couple of things. And yes, that is that's an amazing question and it's not only a question that you're asking me. I think it's a question that we each need to ask ourselves. Um so, and I say that because when all of this hit and you know, we, we all have to remember that in the middle of all of the racism going on and the compounded trauma, we're still in a pandemic. So we're dealing, uh, you know, trauma upon trauma upon trauma. And so I think that before all of this happened, there was this tendency to believe that we're all kind of separate. You know, you're doing your thing. I'm doing my thing. You're on that level. I'm on this level. I'm trying to get to your level. And what, what I think this has done, quite frankly, this has leveled everybody out. Yeah. Everybody, everybody black is on the same level, okay? Yeah, yeah exactly. Whether you're a PhD or a GED, it doesn't really matter. So yeah. I say that to say we have to get really intentional yeah. about looking at each other in terms of community. I know that's something that we've heard a lot about, but now we have to be about it because we're really all that we have right now. So I that's number yeah, I love it. You, you, you mentioned the key word. I, I talked to Bishop Talbert, who is the bishop over at Victoria uh, Temple, and mm -hmm. we, we talked about the black church, and we talked about how more black churches need to be more engaged now, like mm -hmm. before the conversation has always been there, but now because of how things are going, we need to spark the conversation even more. Now, yeah. I was on your Facebook page uh, about a day or so ago, 
and you sparked up a great conversation about what white churches can do right now to literally keep themselves more educated about this and how they can help transition to the things that they don't know about with our race or with the brown race and how they can inform themselves. So talk a little bit about that because when I when I seen that on Facebook, my mom, I just had a brain explosion like this needs, this conversation needs to happen all across the world. Please tell. It does. And, and let me tell you, that conversation came from um, a situation that happened, which is happening quite a bit now. And I'm sure that if it hasn't happened to you yet, it's going to. Right. So you, you have very well-meaning white folks who are reaching out to those in the black community to get answers. Right. But then when we give them the real answers and the honest answers, it looks too ugly. And so they tend to want to water it down. And so what I have said uh, to white churches who, you know, who take my time and the time of all of my black brothers and sisters, I said, look, we are, we are in this fight. We don't get to turn it off. Okay. Right. Um, you have that option, but if you're going to come to us and ask for our input and all of that, then what you also need to do is include us because we see some things coming down the road that you don't see exactly. because you haven't had to see it. So that whole, that, that, that whole, um, that whole talk that I gave, I think it's now at 2,500 views, I think. Yeah. And I was, I was very happy about that because, see, I think that when, when things like this happen, what, what I notice, and I think this is a real good, this is a good piece of information for, um, for really for everybody. What I notice is that a lot of white churches are sitting on the sidelines waiting to be invited by a, quote, official organization, the right. NAA the urban league etc and so i basically just had to remind them you know what uh you do god's work you don't need an invitation no, you, you simply not. don't and so no no you don't wait for black people to show up and co-sign you we right. got a war going on right now and people are dying yeah. so sometimes you need to say it in exactly that language and you know what i had to point out to them was look from here on out um we can't this whole politically correct language that we normally use to make people feel good and nice. No, 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 no. We can't do that anymore because that wastes time. And while black men and women and children are being shot dead in the streets. Okay. No, you have to pick a side right now. So if, if you are in this and I, I came down hard because if you are a faith based institution, I hold you to a whole nother standard. Okay. Yeah. JJ can do whatever they want to do. But if you say, oh, I'm a church and we are a church community, I don't care how much money you have, you're in this. And yeah. you are in this for the right reasons. Because if you got a picture of Jesus on your wall and that's who you say that you follow, then I'm going to hold you to that. Now, that's the same Jesus who, who turned over the money changer tables. Okay. Right. So, see, Jesus was radical. <laughs> he sure he was. was. Radical. I don't right? understand that. I, I, I love how you, you talk. I think what we what white churches don't understand is that the leadership in the white churches are predominantly white, of course. That's mm -hmm. evident. But what the thing is that they don't understand is they rub shoulders with all of the diversifiedness in the church, but they fail to realize that we have a, a voice and that our voices want to be heard and should be heard even within the pulpit especially during times like these, but because of their leadership or leadership style, however, they either don't let us talk or they kind of put us in the back burner and say, okay, we'll let you talk, but we'll let you talk when we get ready to let you talk. Me and my mother did a actual seminar presentation for uh, a church and we, we, we did it twice and we talked about race and diversity. And it was an all-white church. And the youngest person in there was in their 50s. And it really gave a clear definition of how, and this was before the pandemic. This was just like maybe, oh, about sometime on Christmas or somewhere after. But me and my mom really didn't know that they didn't know how important these conversations need to be for everybody in the country. So the reason why I'm telling you this is because you mentioned in that Facebook posting 
that programs need to start happening now for our kids too in yes. regards to the social justice issues that's going on because kids now are looking at their cell phones they're looking at the tv everybody's in a panic and they don't know how to calm themselves down or they're looking at all of this and they're trying to figure out well how does this pertain to me and if it does pertain to me how do i control my emotions where do i go for an outlet so talk a little bit about that because i can't wait to tell you what i've created and i want your help with it <laughs> well and I'll bet you, you've created something great like you always do. But let me tell you something. Um, yeah. First of all, I do want all of you listeners to know that I have created um, a, a brochure. I don't know if you can see it here. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's the Anti-Racism Journey, a Beginner's Resource Guide. It's specifically for white people who don't know where to start, who don't know why black people are all upset, who have no clue about this world and how it's changing. And I want to just very briefly, before I discuss the youth, I want to go back to the issue of the white churches because okay. as, 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 as we talk about how important it is to have black voices not only heard, but integrated into the solutions, okay? What white churches are not understanding, and this is what I also had to tell them, you've got white folks who are very much on edge because this world is changing in a way that they had not anticipated. They don't know what to do with all of this, okay? And so what I've been saying is you, you have two issues that you need to address. You have to address the issue of the black folks over here um, receiving all of this injustice. And then you also have to explain to the good white folks that yes, your world is changing. And let me tell you how it's changing and why, because they don't know. Okay. Right. And so when I, when I, when I talk to the white churches, I make them aware that you, you have a little bit of time to get ahead of this, but if you sit back and do nothing, remember, and I like to, I, I, have, I have to remind people of this. We're at the very beginning of this. Okay. We haven't gotten court dates. We don't have verdicts. We don't have anything. Right. And I was telling, I was telling a therapist yesterday, I said, you know, I think this is the first time in history where we need a trifecta. Okay. We've got three very high profile cases, actually more than that, but the three highest George Floyd, we've got Brianna, and then we've got Ahmad. Yeah. If they don't, if they don't get those right, if they don't get all three of those right, when I tell you that the protests you see now are going to look like child's play. That's true. Okay. And so the church, the church in, in its, really the church as a whole, but white churches specifically, they have a real opportunity in this hour. And I've been saying for the longest, this is where white folks get to change history. Yeah. This is where they get to do it right now, all right? But what's coming down the pike, you gotta get ready for it because we're not ready for it. We're right. simply not. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I made this brochure Anybody can email me at blackmenmatter at gmail.com. I will send it to them free of charge. Doesn't cost you anything. Has a bunch of resources. But I want to address your issue with the children. Yes. Because you know, I'm in, I'm in school. I know. School. I know. Me and, and you have a heart yeah. for youth, and we've always had a heart for youth. So go I'm ahead. Gonna, I'm gonna cut you off. And, let, and let me tell you, this is going to take a community effort. This is, this is literally, it takes a village. Because I'm watching kids they don't know what to do with all of this information. Right. And we're the adults. And I realize that many of us adults don't know what to do with all this information. Right. But we've got to create some, some programming, both outside of school and in school for the next year. This is not a sprint, this is a marathon. Because what's gonna happen and what I've been telling um, my teaching colleagues who are in predominantly white schools that have black students, I said, oh no, you all are going to have some issues, yeah. okay? Yeah. So you're going to have to look at things like restorative justice. You're going to have to look at things like, um, you know, conflict resolution programs. You're going to have to go heavy into that because our kids, they don't know what to do with all of this. You know, I heard a young man say, well, if they're going to shoot me anyway, then fine. So this is a black young man. So in terms of where he is mentally, I'm very concerned, all right? right? Right. Because what that tells me is nobody has been working with him and just helping him process it. Right. Just helping with the processing, you know? Yeah. 
I, I have, uh, and I'm glad you're mentioning this, I have put up on my shoulders, I started a non-for-profit organization called Reasons to Believe. And mm -hmm. right when the pandemic happened, we were on our way to get grant funding and try to get everything for grant money. But because the pandemic happened, uh, we can't get no money right now. Yep. So literally, we are in a state of no funds. So what do we do? We start asking for seed money for other organizations. And uh, people within our board started giving money. And the reason why I'm saying this is because we are trying to get something for kids to latch on to besides what they see on social media. Everything right. that they're doing right now from the ages of 10 and up is either on YouTube, mm -hmm. Facebook, any social media brand, and these kids don't know how to regulate the difference between yeah. fantasy, reality, and then self-care. Their self-care is literally looking on the phone. And that's yeah. troubling, very troubling yeah. for you. So I've created a program and it's called Reasons to Believe. And what we're gonna do, and I'm gonna ask you later on down the line, as soon as we get other things set up, Miss Miss Henry is that these kids need activities to do with other kids to help regulate their minds and to really make uh, activities more engaging and fun for them to have self-care. And it's absolutely, just, absolutely simple, but it's hard for them because this is all that they know. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, I have to say this because I think, I think the time that we're in, and there's a poet, Glenn North, shout out to Glenn oh, North. Oh yeah, shout out to Glenn North. What up, bro? Dub Love he that man. Poetic yeah. Oh, I love him down to my toes. Let me tell you, he he was he created a poem, and there was one phrase in there that stopped me in my tracks. Uh -huh. He referred to this pandemic as a divine disruption. Wow. A divine disruption. Now, that was before all this other stuff happened. Mm -hmm. Now as I look at what's going on with the racism and with all of this social up, upheaval, right. I'm looking at this very much as a divine disruption. On this level, you now have to do some individual soul searching. Mm. You must have to, and you have to tell the truth. So when you talk about youth and self-care, I think the other piece of that that I hope the adults, we the adults don't lose, Let's not talk to these young people uh, in code. Let's tell the truth because they're seeing the truth. Right. They know what happened to George Floyd. There's no need for us to talk about, well, you know, the police officer acted inappropriately. No, they saw the tape just like we saw the tape, okay? Right. And so what often happens, and you know this being in schools, mm -hmm. what frustrates our youth is that they know the truth of what happens, but here comes an adult who wants to, you know, gloss it over and make it I sound, know. yeah, wants to sound like something that, you know, really didn't happen. And so you don't want to do that. We want to engage them truthfully. We want to talk to them about self-care and get them into some self-care practices, okay? Right. So even... Um, I worked with a wonderful, wonderful lady, um, Dr. Tolson, um, in, in the KC Mo School District. She has a yoga program that, uh, that is for kids as little as uh, four years old, okay? Mm -hmm. It teaches them breathing techniques. So things like that are very important. And to your point about the social media, what I do want to say is, I'm not going to say that all social media is bad. I'm right. going to say we need to meet these young people where they are. So if everybody's on TikTok, Let's do some programming and put it on TikTok so that they can see some self-care on TikTok. Love Look, it. I'm not, I'm not going to fight it no more. Okay, <laughs> I'm not going to fight it. My, my whole question right now is, where are you? I'll come to you. Right. Right. Uh-oh. Gotcha. You're all right. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, I'm going to come to you. So, um, yeah, if they're on TikTok, let's put something on TikTok. If they're yeah. on Facebook, let's put something on Facebook. Yeah, so so what we have now is a generation that wants to be like, you know, instant famous. Everybody wants to be viral. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to have a million followers. Everybody wants to be mm -hmm. inst instantaneously uh, microwave famous. <clears throat> Not knowing that, you know, even though that takes hard work or you might want to have that, the backlash that comes with that is, I mean, it could be, it could be detrimental both physically and mentally. 
And what I've come to find out is, is that if we would give, like you mentioned earlier, if we would give the kids the truth and let them know really the truth behind the matter of how everything works in society and that it's really not about what they see now, but it's about the big picture, is that one day you're gonna become an adult, one day you're gonna to wanna to have a child, and then within you having a child or within that concept or process of having a child, how would you want your child to be facilitated, treated, and admired in this world? Kids don't understand that right now. All they no. see is just this, this picture, but we need to show them the big picture. That's why I created Reasons to Believe so they can start believing in the fact that there really is some solutions out there and there are people like you and I who understand where they come from to help them bridge over to where they want to be with their dreams. So absolutely. I, absolutely. I absolutely love, um, Lisa, like how you made this available, the, the, the anti-racism guide, and I'm getting back to you on that because mm -hmm. I think the churches are now starting to understand a little bit that this conversation mm -hmm is somewhat important, but we don't know really how to make it uh, a, a thing coming up in future services. I don't know about you, but I've, I've been listening on TV today. The COVID uh, has increased. Uh, everybody in America knows uh, the pandemic is increasing and they're thinking about sh shutting everything back down again. Mm -hmm. So within that saying, <laughs> everything just opened back up like right, right. two weeks ago. So we're gonna have more people mentally trying to figure out how they're gonna be able to get all this anxiousness and anxiety and all these things out. And Lisa, one of the things that I do, and I don't know if you do this, but I, I know you do because you this is what you do as a professor. One of the things I do, and this is very real for me, I love, absolutely love jazz, smooth jazz music, mm. not just as a particular ear to listen to, but it's soothing to the soul. It is. And I don't know if anybody's ever tried to meditate or to listen to jazz of any sort. I preferably like contemporary or smooth jazz has ever used that. But I want you to give your own personal opinion about music and how that can actually soothe the soul, especially during these trying times. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up um, because actually um, in the whole uh, piece of getting youth involved and getting them engaged, I think this is where the arts step in in a brilliant way. So we were just talking about um, our, our, our friend, um, Mr. Glenn North, yeah. uh, who is an amazing poet. I think this is where the artist community gets together and we say, hey, how can we use music and dance and poetry so that these kids, a lot of them may not know how to verbalize exactly what they're feeling, but they can put it in a song, they can put it in a dance, they can put it in a poem, okay? We have some amazing young people who write, okay? So what I'm, what I'm saying is that yes, the music part is a big deal and you know that just it's, music has been a part of my life since Mine's I got here. Know that. And yours too, exactly, exactly. So then the question becomes, because for me, I believe that what's happening now, kids and adults, they're hearing a lot of, they're hearing a lot of harshness. They're hearing a lot of harsh words. They're hearing a lot of, you know, harsh emotions. And any music that will calm you, be it jazz, classical music, um, there's a there's a wonderful sister who does therapy with the um, with the bowls, you know, the little the little bowls, the resonating bowls. Yeah. What that is that brings you to a place of center, I think is going to be important because, as you very wisely pointed out. Uh, so we've got COVID going on, things are open, then they might be closed. Mm -hmm. Now, you put that on top of the racist situations that we're going through, police brutality, and just trying to figure all of this out, that will do a number on your psyche. And what's, what's, what's so interesting is that with all of this going on, we still live in a world that expects us to perform, okay? Now, imagine how hard that is for adults to do, okay? you can really see how hard that would be for a child to do, a 10 year old, a 12 year old, who right. just wants to go to school and have fun. Right. That's what they want to do. Right. Well, you know, 
go ahead. I'm li li I'm listening. No, so I'm 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 just saying we have to look at music and really all of the arts as one of those engagement pieces, even more, even more now than we ever have. You know, we had a lot of schools that I know have cut out music programs and all of that and visual art programs. Got to bring them back. Got to bring them all back. I was getting ready to allude to that. I, um, if anybody knows me, they know I play the drums. Um, they know bass. I play the bass. <laughs> yep. uh, and I absolutely love it. I mean, I can do it all day. People don't really realize the therapeutic uh, healing that involves in music, not only as you listen to it, but as you literally play it. And for you, like people know if, if they can hear, and I know they can hear us now, but the tone of your, your voice, I'm specifically talking your voice, is a soothing mechanism for healing. Thank you. And if <laughs> nobody understands that right now we need to be in a place, like you mentioned, where we can center ourselves, mm -hmm. focus, relax, and kind of put things and give it to God, put things to where we can give it to a higher being, rest and assure ourselves this is the perfect time to do two things one is if you ain't got the bible this might be a time to open up some pages and maybe dibble in it and dabble in it and then two, yeah, it might, might be right <laughs> and then two if there's a favorite song i'm a praise and worship guy i love jazz and all that but i also listen to praise and worship if you have that saturate your atmosphere in your home with some type mm -hmm. of favorite gospel tune that lifts your spirit and gives you that yeah. permit that you need daily. Um, because yes. those are self-healing tools that actually work. Um, yeah. I'm a fan of yours for a lot of reasons. I know you know Anita Baker and all these other great artists that you've been blessed to be around, sung around world, sung for presidents. But Kansas City, and I don't know if they realize this, but we have a jewel in Lisa Henry. She has yeah. done so much for the community in Kansas City, around the world, and people, I don't know if they take it for granted or not, she works with the Urban League. She does a lot of great things. I have been a witness of her having stacks upon stacks of paperwork <laughs> to tell people and to inform people. If you don't know how to get it, she will get it for you and make get sure you got all the details <laughs> you need to do to get stuff done. So I'm saying that because I have I have about three minutes left, Lisa, but I always like uh, when you come in, I want to say thank you. I'm going to play us a, uh, a game with you real quick. And the, okay. The game is this. Um, so I know you're a musician slash singer, and so I want to ask you maybe two questions. One is, who is your favorite singer of all time? It could be. Oh no, that is Army, such a long question. Jazz. Oh, I, I've never asked you this. Now you gotta remember, I've been knowing you oh, for twenty seven. <laughs> give me okay. If not your favorite, give me at least your your top two or three. Cause I got one more question to ask. You. Okay. Oh, and see, I know I'm not gonna cover them all, so I'm just I'm just gonna say it like that. Okay. Okay. Of course, of course, Billy Holiday is always in my. Um not only because of her voice, but just because of what she endured to be able to do her, her craft. And along with that, um, Ella Fitzgerald, definitely the same. This was a woman who was basically orphaned and she still, she still found a way to live her dream. So whenever I have my really down moments, I think of those women who were living in a, in a time that was even worse than this right. and they still accomplished and achieved. So definitely them. Now, um, my other one, uh, this is a woman and I have no idea what she's saying because she sings in Portuguese. Uh -huh. Her name is, her name is Rosa Passos. Oh, okay. Rosa Passos is a singer and guitar player out of Brazil. And let me tell you, whenever I'm having a bad day and I need to hear some soothing, something to just calm my soul. Yeah. I put on something that she is singing. I don't understand the word of it, but the way she, her voice is just so, it sounds like an angel has just come down and told me to just lay my head on their lap. Wait. That voice sounds like to me. And so, yeah, so those are my top three. Okay, okay, I, 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 as they say, I can dig that, I can dig that. <laughs> I can dig that. Um, for, for me, 
uh, of course, you are you are up there as far as live individuals or soothing soothing voices is jazz. And another person that I would say is Anita Baker. I love. Oh, yeah. I love, I love. She's one. I love her. So the question I have for you is real quick: is who would be um, your favorite? Um, uh, I had it in the back of my head, and I just lost my train of thought. But who would be your favorite? male jazz musician. Oh God. See, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I will and, okay, and then I and then we'll uh, and then yeah. that you see okay. you know, you're a historian behind this. So you can I that's why I wanted to get your I wanted to pick your brain a little bit because you know them all pretty much. But go ahead. Well and see this is the thing and I have to say I have been my life has been a blessed one. I always tell people I'm not a rich woman in terms of material things, but let me tell you, I've had the honor and privilege of working with people like George Duke, may he rest in peace. I've worked with, you know, Herbie Hancock. I work with him off and on through the Hancock Institute of Jazz. Um, T.S. Monk, the son of Thelonious Monk. You know, I've gotten a chance. Bradford Marcellus. Yeah, yeah, brand for all of those folks. I have had I have been in proximity to some of the greatest. And when I say the greatest, it's not just musical. When you're on the road with these people, you get to see their spirits. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, when you get to that level, that height of artistry, and having the opportunity to say work with Herbie. Okay, so Herbie is definitely one of my main ones. He's, up, he's like at the top. He's one of the yeah, best. Yeah, at the top. And he's at the top because I'm, I'm, I, I am remembering and and I know that you have a time limit here, yep. but I, I am specifically remembering a situation. I was on tour with him, uh, myself and another group of artists. We were on tour with Herbie and we went in, it was the city, I can't even remember the city, but they were sold out of hotel rooms. And the only thing they had left was a Ramada Inn. Well, you know, Herbie is beyond the Ramada, okay? So everyone was kind of nervous. They're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You know, all that's open is the Ramada. And so everyone was kind of kind of upset because they're like, okay, we don't know what Herbie's gonna do. And you know, cause this is not his, he, he's way beyond the Ramada. Mm -hmm. And so when they finally brought it to him and we all were standing there, I'll never, and I can bear witness to this, so they said, well, you know, Herbie, the only thing we have is the Ramada and they're going to try to make the room as nice as they can, but uh, they literally have no other hotel rooms in the city. And so Herbie just says, okay. And so we're all standing there because, I mean, we're, we're a bunch of nobodies, okay? Mm -hmm. And we're kind of flexing on the fact that we get to be on tour with Herbie. But let me tell you what the lesson was in that. And I'll never forget it. If Herbie's okay with the Ramada Inn, everybody's okay with the Ramada Inn. Exactly. And see that humility in action? It hit me differently as an artist because I was looking at one of the greatest in the world being humble in spirit and not being, not, not playing the role, which he very well could have. Um, but it really said a lot to me at, on a personal level, but also on an artistic level. So Herbie's definitely up there. Um, gotcha. God. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, my time is getting short, but listen. I know, I know. I, I wanna, I wanna, we, we might do a part two later on down the line, but. Yeah, but, let's do Let's but do Ms. it. Henry, I, I wanted to tell you, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just witnessed jazz legendary right here with Miss Lisa Henry. And I wanna thank her so much for coming on the pod show. Thank and, you. Tune in the next time. Lisa, I need you to stay on the line for me, but I got to pay some bills. Tune in next time for Focus Driven with John Hudson. God bless you. Peace. Oh, tight.